You take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of 2 Chronicles in chapter number 5. 2 Chronicles in chapter number 5, and uh, we are kind of in between some of the series that I've been doing on Sunday morning, and uh, next month we're going to put a big emphasis on missions, and then starting in November I will be in the book of Nehemiah and the book of Mark. And so we're kind of had this parentheses between finishing the book of Hebrews and starting the book of Nehemiah. And uh, with missions starting next week, I just thought uh, I was praying about what the Lord would have me to preach. And uh, sometimes, uh, not, not, not very often, but sometimes um, I will preach somebody else's message. Amen. Is that allowed? <laughs> I will tell you when I do that, okay? Now, the reason that I'll do that, because the message came from the scriptures, and um, somebody probably said it better than I could have, and I thought, uh, but it's truth, and so truth should be declared. And so the message, the, when I say their message, the idea, the, the concept, um, hearing a message by a pastor named Pastor Wayne Hardy, and he preached a message from this passage on the concept of worship. And uh, some of the things that he said I thought were unique and, uh, and I thought were necessary, really, to be honest with you, in the health of a church. I don't know if you know this, but people by nature drift. You don't know that. Okay, I know that. People by nature, we drift, okay? It's hard to stay on track, isn't it? I mean, you really have to. The Bible says Paul had to bring every thought into captivity. That we have to work hard to keep ourselves in, in line and walking in the word of God and the ways of God. By nature, I, I want to do that which I want to do. And, and by nature, my responses are in the flesh. And so I have to subjugate and mortify, therefore, the deeds of the flesh. And so we would understand that if you, you have honesty within yourself. By nature, we drift from the truth. That's why Paul said, I have to die daily. I have to die to myself and yield myself to the Spirit, yield myself to the Word of God. If not, drifting produces drifting, produces drifting. Pretty soon, I, I'm surprised at where I'm at. Well, if that's true for individuals, is it not also true for churches? That churches by nature drift? Churches by nature, because of the reality of, of the aesthetics and the function and the activity and the interaction relationships and all those things, churches by nature drift. You know, like preacher, are you saying we're drifting? We have a tendency to drift. If we're, bitten, if we're made up of humans who have a tendency to drift, then collectively we can have a tendency to drift. We just have to be honest unless we think we're something special or unique. And one of those areas that we have, churches have a tendency to drift is in their purpose of how and why they worship. How and why they worship. And this is not going to be a message about uh, methods of worship or, or style of worship because we need to go deeper than that. Because we can, we can find ourselves being caught in the gray areas and really not get to the matter of the heart is where we want to be. And this is what often has happened, and I think we need to be reminded of this, specifically when we are dealing with, when we're dealing with the area of worship, the biblical endorse method, or, or one of the predominant biblically endorsed methods of worship is music. Music is a, and we're going to see it in the scriptures, and, and it makes its way all throughout the scriptures. That music is the method of worship, but sometimes what happens is by tendency, I don't know about you, but when I drift, I drift because things become about me, okay? When I drift, it's because things become about me. And what happens in churches sometimes, and it doesn't matter what church it is, it doesn't matter all the aesthetics, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. What happens in churches is sometimes the worship will be diminished because it's become about them. 
And when we get into the scriptures, it's, it's interesting that the main audience of music within that corporate worship, especially that main audience of music is not men. The main audience of music is God. And even when you see, and we read this morning in, in Psalm 100, it says, sing unto the Lord. There in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 19, a verse that we might know, it says where we sing song, songs and hymns and spiritual songs that we encourage one another, that we can be the audience too. But even in that passage, the very last few words of that verse in Ephesians 5, 19 is unto the Lord. Now, what happens is, just like in so many areas of, of drifting, as it becomes about us, it doesn't mean that we necessarily stop the activity, but we are failed to be reminded of the purpose of the activity. We can, things can become as rote. Things can become uh, just as a pattern. You have a pattern of, of when you walk into somebody and you say to them, Hi, I hope you're having a good day. How is your day going? Have you ever asked somebody how their day was going and did not mean it at all? Okay, half of us are truthful. Yeah, in other words, you didn't really want them to tell you how their day was going. And when you say, how's your day going? You're like, oh man, let me tell you. You think, oh great. <laughs> so why did you ask them how your day was going? Because that's the cordial thing to do. That's the nice thing to do is to ask them how you're doing. But have you also at times asked somebody genuinely, how is your day going? And you wanted to hear their response. And, and if they were going through difficulty or heartache or trouble, that you were moved by the things that they were going through and, and you were genuinely responding to them. And things can become of rote. And that's what can happen within churches. And this is not to you say, preacher, do we have... An issue, uh, anybody ever change the oil in their car? Yeah, it's a good idea, okay? It's a good idea to change the oil in your car before it starts making noises, right? You change the oil in your car because it's necessary for the continual proper function of the car. And I just led to, to remind us of this, not because we need to, you know, have some, you know, we're, we're having some issue or but it, we need to be, I need to be reminded of it, that when we come to sing, it can become a method of just something that's done out of rote. In fact, guess who can be the worst at it? Me. You know why? Because I'm getting ready to preach. I have a message in my head and I have a message in my heart and I'm ready to preach it. Sometimes I'm like, would you just hurry up and shut up the singing so I can preach? <laughs> Get it over with. Sometimes I'm looking at the clock going, <laughs> they think I preach long. They sing long. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, I need an excuse, right? And sometimes I'm, as I'm sitting there trying to sing, it's, other things are going on in my mind. I'm doing this. And one of the big problems is we forget that not only the audience of music of that corporate worship, the audience of that corporate worship is, uh, is, is God, there is a purpose to it. So let's first, before we read our text, think about the purpose of preaching. You know what the purpose of preaching is? The purpose of preaching is not simply so that uh, somebody can stand up and declare uh, some truth or declare uh, some opinion or declare the scriptures. The purpose of preaching is the movement of men. That God would use his word and his spirit to move men to move women, to move children, to change, to acquiesce, to humble, to, to confess, to, to, to be encouraged, to be bolstered. That's one of the reasons that we still have an old-fashioned altar. So at the end of the service, when we stand up, if God has worked in your heart, you've been convicted, encouraged, or you've been burdened, that we seek that movement that comes down to the altar where you're humbled before God and you get on your knees and you say, God, forgive me, help me, encourage me. You burden me and we are moved by men. If preaching doesn't move men, then it's a waste of time. What a waste of time. Well, that can be one of two problems. The problem can be the preaching or the problem can be the men or women or children. 
And so we have to, we have to listen. We have to pay attention. The audience of the preaching is men for the movement of men. Well, the audience of the singing and the worship is God. For what purpose? For the movement of God. For the presence of God. Not just because that is the religious uh, methodology that we use and, and we break our service up into different parts. We have the singing part because that's what we need to do. And we have the preaching part. And, and I'm not really good at the singing part. I like the preaching part. Or I like the music part and not the preaching part. Listen, it's not about that. It's about we have an audience and the audience is God. And when we sing unto him, we actually are singing unto him and we desire his work and his movement in our hearts. So we're going to use this passage and kind of look at it as an example, though it is not the only example. We'll, I'll mention a few more. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 5. Historically, what has happened is the children of Israel now have established kings, and Saul has been king, and, and David has been king, and the tabernacle has been the place of worship up to this point. And David said, God, can I build you a house? And God said, no, you're a man of war. I will have your son build me a house. And so Solomon will build the temple. And Solomon builds the temple. And this is at the time of dedication of the temple. And there's much to go into the study. We're taking a highlight portion of this. Uh, Solomon's prayer of dedication is an incredible thing. The sacrifice is an incredible thing. But we're going to look at this portion of the dedication. Look what it says in chapter 5 beginning in verse number 11. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place... For all the priests that were present were sanctified and did, uh, and did not then wait by course. And also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jephthah, uh, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets." And it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in the praising and thanking of the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. So that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now, can I just stop for a minute and tell you that's pretty cool? That's pretty awesome. All these things are taking place, all of them important, and you can go back and study the dedication of the temple. But there is one particular thing that produced the movement of the Lord upon men, and that was the praise and worship of men to their God. To worship God, to talk about the goodness of God and being thankful to the Lord. And they sang and they did it with voice and they did it with instruments and they sang to the Lord and the Lord came down. This is not the only place that the music produced the movement of God. If you think back biblically, uh, Jehoshaphat is fighting a battle. And what do you fight? What do you use to fight a battle? You use weapons. Guess what Jehoshaphat used? He used, he brought the Levites out and he says, I want you to sing to the beauty of God. And he sang to the beautiful works of God. And God came down and won the battle and destroyed the enemy for the children of Israel. Not only Jehoshaphat, but Josiah in reference to his reformation, in reference to his revival of the children of Israel to, to, to remind them of the need to come back to God. He brought and introduced uh, singing to be associated with, uh, with the sacrifices. And Hezekiah brought singing to be associated uh, with the sacrifices. Uh, under Solomon in the temple, some 4,000 Levite priests will be dedicated to the singing and praising with instruments to the Lord God. Music was used to give the audience of God the praise, desiring that God would bring the, his, his spirit and move upon the people and produce a heart ready to receive and worship. Well, preacher, things are different now. Well, it's true. We, we are in a church. This is not the temple. This is not the tabernacle. In fact, can I tell you where the temple is? 
What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? But even here still, we come corporately together. And if we're not careful in our singing, it will just be something that is a matter of rote. It'll be something that is just done because that's a part of our service, the religiosity of our service. Religion has a way of creeping in and diminishing the value and meaning of those things that are important. And the only way that we have to make, or well, the only way we're going to be able to make sure that the emphasis goes back is not necessarily to change the mechanics or change uh, producing some emotional response. It's not about some outward display. It's about having a heart of worship that will declare that worship and sing in praise to God individually as we corporately meet together. We sing and praise to God. Well, Psalm, if we could go back to Psalm 100, it gives us that concept. Can we go to Psalm 100 and look and see what the Bible says? 16 times through these passages, we will see the phrase, sing unto the Lord. You can go through these Psalms over and over again. It is sing unto the Lord. It says in Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with th singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting. And, the tr and his truth endureth to all generations. The reason that it's so important is because when we come corporately together... We see Paul tells Timothy, he says, this is how thou art to behave thyself or behave thyself in the, in the church, the pillar and ground of truth. We're, we're worshiping God together. And there is a function of the preaching being responsive. Men respond to preaching. But sometimes when we drift, we begin to become self-centered. We think about the value of preaching and we think about the benefit of preaching. And this is not to minimize preaching. Well, preacher, if we put such an emphasis on music, then it's going to overshadow the preaching. If good, wholesome, God-worshipping music overshadows the preaching, it's the preaching's fault. Okay, let me say that again. If good, wholesome, God-honoring, worshipful music overshadows the preaching, it's the preaching's fault. Because it's not, it doesn't have to be in competition. Right. Now it is true that we as men can put too much of an emphasis on something. But the way to do it, the way to maximize preaching is not to minimize singing. That's not the way to do it. Amen. The way to do it is to be reminded of the purpose of it as the preaching is declared for the movement of men, for the movement of sinners to come and be saved, for Christians to come and be right with God, for Christians to be encouraged, for Christians to be taught and admonitioned and, and provoked. That's the purpose of preaching. And so the focus of that preaching should be outward towards men, but the focus of the singing should be upward towards God. Which means, as passionate as the preacher is about preaching, so as passionate the people should be about singing praise to their God. Amen. I don't know about you, but I, str I would struggle. And this may not be a fair statement. You can tear this apart later. But I would struggle standing up and saying, oh, I'm going to preach today and I don't know. I really think according to the Bible you should be nice. <laughs> you should be good. And uh, I don't know. Read it. You'll get it. I mean, give me a break. There should be some passion associated with the preaching. That passion is not always declared the same way by different people's personalities. Uh, some people are more loud and bolsterous, and some people are more quiet and declarative. But you should still sense that somebody has the truth of God's Word in their heart, and as they declare it to you, you should know that they believe it, and you should know that they have a burden to share it, whether they shout it from the rooftops or they say it intensely in a whisper. You should know that they're some passionate about it. And the preacher has that responsibility of not just being bolsterous because you can be loud and say stupid stuff. But make sure that you're declaring the very word of God. 
passionately. That's a responsibility that the person declaring God's word has is to declare the word of God for the movement of men. Well, this is not a spectator sport. You don't come to church simply to hear a man stand up and preach. Though you come to church to hear a man stand up and preach, you come to church to engage and participate in worship. And when you stand before God, whether you're singing a song that is 500 years ago or you're singing a song that is three weeks old, it doesn't matter that you're declaring that worship to God and it should be done with a heart of passion. It should be done with a heart of purpose. It should be done with a heart of intent that these words that I'm saying mean something to me. Amen. Can you imagine? Can you imagine after the service, somebody coming up into me and saying, hey, I had a question about what you preached. What did you mean by this? I don't know. I just preached it. <laughs> don't ask me questions. Don't ask me details. I just stand up there and preach what comes to mind. And I just read. This is what one guy said about it. So I just said what he said about it. Don't ask me questions about it. I don't know. That would be ridiculous. Yeah. Amen. Well, how often do we sing a song and not even pay attention to what we're singing? That's why it's important that the songs we sing have some meaning, have some depth and purpose to them, maybe even some doctrine in them, some truth in them, as we declare to God what he knows already, but he's still worthy to hear it from us. So that declaration, in fact, there's been such an emphasis, there's been such an emphasis over time that we are seeing not only that we are drifting from it, but we're also drifting from the ability to engage in it. Do you know, if you go back and study David, David hired somebody. He hired somebody to be in charge of the music and to, to teach the music and to teach people to sing the music. If you read in the book of Nehemiah, and we'll get there at some point, when you read in the book of Nehemiah, one of the big problems, he's like, how come we don't have any worship? Well, because those Levites and priests that were supposed to be engaging in the worship, the people decided it's not worth it. And so they stopped giving them their portion. And so they had to stop engaging in their corporate worship to go out and find some other means of existence. And Nehemiah says, no, 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 this is wrong. God set it up that they would get their portion by carrying out this worship. And you have not paid them appropriately. And so he told the people, he gathered them together, and he basically said this, pay the singers so they'll sing. Because it's an important part of worship. Now, this is not a message about getting Brother George more money. Where are you at, Brother George? Okay. And, and he deserves more money. God bless him. This is not about that. This is about there is a strong emphasis in the scriptures, not just about the uh, declaration of music and about the singing of music, but also about the uh, uh, propagation of music that we would know how to do it and we'd be able to sing it. Now, I'm going to get off on a slight pet peeve. Is that okay? I'm going to take four minutes to get off on a pet peeve. Some of you that are older might know this because you can go back 30, 40, 50 years ago and what you'll find is that there was a lot of singing done in the house. Somebody knew how to play the piano. And they would gather around the piano do you know that it's very difficult? If you go back, I collect old hymnals. So if you have old hymnals, give them to me. I collect old hymnals. I have an 1898 a Baptist hard shell hymnal. It's one of my favorite. I have some hymnals from the 30s. Do you know that those hymnals, we would have a hard time bringing in and giving out to the people to sing? Because what they sang as a congregation in the 30s would now have to be learned by a choir because the IQ of music has diminished so much. It's diminished. What they would sing, I, I love looking at these old hymnals and in the 30s and you'd look at them and all of a sudden you'd see the altos take the lead and then the basses take the lead and then the tenors take the lead. You're like, oh, preacher, are you getting on to me because I can't sing? No, no, Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Okay? In the 30s, there were people that could not sing. But I'm just telling you, the overall IQ of music was much higher then. Because there was an emphasis on learning how to sing. 
And what has happened over time is like a lot of other things in the church, like witnessing and like preaching and like teaching, we've developed this idea, let's leave it to the professionals. Let's leave it to the professionals. No, 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 these things are not to be left to the professionals. Right, Guess who's to be a witness amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ? Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Guess who should be teaching others about the Lord Jesus Christ? Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Guess who should be singing unto the Lord Jesus Christ? Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not something left to professionals. That's one of the areas where the church, and I don't care what your style and methodology is, that doesn't matter. It can, it can be drift in every area where let's just leave it to the professionals. No, no. Praise is to be something that corporately is done by the body of believers as we sing unto the Lord. And we desire to please Him and honor Him and praise His name. We see the emphasis of music in the Old Testament we see the emphasis of music in the church in the New Testament, even Ephesians chapter 5, where we are to encourage one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs as unto the Lord. Music's main audience is the Lord God. So what do we do, preacher? How do we do? Do I, do I go take music lessons? No. No. I mean, you can. Go ahead. But that's not the point. The point is to have a heart and desire to worship the Lord. Right, amen. And we have a biblically endorsed method of that worship, and that's singing. Amen. And so we take the hymnals, we take the song, we use the chorus, whatever it is, and we open it up, and we sing unto the Lord. Amen. You know, it makes a difference if there's intent and purpose to it. It makes a difference. It makes a difference if there is a desire to declare to the Lord your thankfulness and the beauty of Him. The truths that can be declared in singing are truths that transcend personal difficulty. They just transcend cultural difficulty. They transcend the difficulties of a nation. They transcend all those things because they are truths that are declared of the Lord. And He is an immutable God who changes not. And I can always sing of the beauty of his works. And I can always sing of the thankfulness that I have towards him. And I can always sing of my desire to serve him with gladness because he is God. Amen. So the question comes down to this idea. If preaching is to produce the movement of men in their heart ultimately, whether they're in their seat or come to an altar, it produces the movement of men. And singing is to produce the movement of God as he responds to our praise, then there should be a passion not just to perform the function of a service, but actually declare worship unto God. Brother Corey gave a quote last week, and the quote basically said this, the most worshipful services are services that are going to take you by surprise because they weren't built on the uh, corporation of worship. They were just a function of worship. So preacher, what should we do? How can we make our work, music more worshipful? Well, maybe we could hire some professionals. Uh, maybe we could do that. No, no, no. No, we don't have to change anything. Right, amen. The only thing we have to do is sing unto the Lord. Amen. Play unto the Lord. Amen. Take it serious. There's some people that will stand up here and sing in choir. That's why we want, to, we want the specials of the music to be a small portion of the singing. The majority of the portion is the corporate worship of everybody. But these people that have taken time out of their day and life and week to practice something specifically and to work hard to learn something should sing it unto the Lord. Amen. It's important. Man, what would you imagine if a preacher stood up and said, hey, I hope I got something for you today. I didn't study this week, but there's lots of good stuff in here. Let me find one. Okay. Uh, let's see. Revelation 22. No, that's too hard. Uh, you know, and, and you just stand up and just preach whatever comes to your mind. That would be ridiculous. You know what you expect a preacher to do? To study and prepare and to pray and be ready to stand up and declare what God has put into his heart. 
Well, how much less would it be important for, for us to stand up here and prepare to sing declaration unto the Lord to the encouragement of the brethren? And Vivian and, I mean, uh, what's her face? Gwyneth and, and Spencer stood up here this morning singing, basically a warning. Don't take God for granted. Don't take God for granted. There's a snare in prosperity. You better remember to be thankful to the Lord. Man, that was an important declaration. They didn't just stand up there haphazardly and say, I guess I'll sing something today. No, there was time and preparation and purpose into it because it was meant to be given as a worship to the Lord to encourage the brethren. That's a part of worship. Well, preacher, I don't know some of these songs. Okay, learn them. But this is what happens sometimes. I don't know that one. He's worth you learning something new. He's worth it. Yeah, but I don't think I'll sing right. It's okay. He can handle it. <laughs> Literally, God can take your most horrific singing and turn it into the beautiful news uh, sound as it comes unto him. He can do that. Well, I'm just, not, I'm just not a public person. This is a place for public praise. It's important. It's one of the reasons we do it together because sometimes it is difficult for one person to stand up here and sing. That's a little bit intimidating. And so not everybody's built for that. That's okay. So we do most of it together. Family together. And some of you should take the worship home with you. And you should go home and sing some songs together at home. Make it a part of your worship. I don't know any songs. Find some. Take a hymn book. Go, you, there's a thousand songs you can sing. Doesn't have to be a song that we sing. Find a song you sing. And sing it unto the Lord. It's something that must be taught to our children. In a day and age where it's very easy for worship to be, or for singing to be associated with self-praise, there's a television show. You know what the name of the television show is? American Idol. I, I like watching some of those times, especially when people that can't sing, sing. I'm like, that's really bad. <laughs> oh my goodness. And some of them are immensely talented. And you're like, wow, that's really good. But do you understand the basic concept? I want to be an idol. What do you do with idols? You worship them. Now, that's a silly show, but it is a concept that is pervasive within the declaration of music and it can make its way into our church. And guess who has the struggles perhaps sometimes the most with it? It's young people as they're coming up. Somebody needs to teach them that singing is not for their glory, but it's for God's glory. Amen. Well, preacher, that's your job. No, that's your job. Amen. And one of the best ways to do it is don't to be shy of your bad voice. Because sometimes the only reason you don't sing is because you're afraid your bad voice won't give you glory. So around the dinner table, sing unto the Lord. In the car, sing unto the Lord. When you come in to worship, sing unto the Lord. And that, let's not let those of you that play instruments get off the hook. And you go to 2 Chronicles, guess what there was a lot of? Play unto the Lord. Play unto the Lord. All sorts of instruments in there. Study the instruments in the, in the scriptures. There's some pretty unique ones. And play unto the Lord. And you should use your talents for the Lord. This is the place of corporate worship. So worship through music is done to the audience of God for his movement. Isn't it pretty incredible that God gives us something in his word? That he says he responds to? Yes, amen. He responds example after example. You can look at David and Solomon and, and Josiah. You can look at uh, um, uh, Nehemiah. You can look at Ezra when they came back. Let me just give you this last example. Ezra is coming back. The temple is in re rubble. There's nothing but stones. There's nothing pretty or wonderful 
In fact, all of it is a declaration of their mistakes and their disobedience and their sin. And what does Ezra lead them to do? Sing and worship unto the Lord. And it is a declaration. We don't come to church to fulfill a religious responsibility. We don't come to church to fulfill a religious function. We don't come to church because we have to. We come to church to worship the Lord our God and sing praise to His name and to His person. Amen. And if we're not careful, this is an area where churches can drift. Where it can just become a matter of rote. Okay, let's sing. All right, done. Next. Choir can get that way. Now their practice. Now their thing. Christmas is coming up. Let's do our Christmas music. It's going to be awesome. But let's do our Christmas music. Okay, we did it. Done. Uh, no, 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 no. This is singing unto the Lord. And wherever you fit within that function, you may never stand on this platform or even desire to stand on this platform and sing a note to God. That's okay. That's not how we function as a church. But you are to be there singing praise to the Lord your God. Amen. And if God has you on this platform, you should take it seriously and you should sing praise unto the Lord and give your very best to God. If you play an instrument, you should take it seriously and do your very best and give your best to God and worship the Lord God. Thankful that we have so many examples of that. But this is not about just highlighting a few examples of people that are doing it right. It's about the church singing and praising God together to his name. That we might give audience to God. He as our audience might hear our worship and hear our praise. Go back to 2 Chronicles and I'll be done. I love what it says here. In chapter 5, verse number 13, the sequence. It says, It came even to pass as the trumpeter and singers were one. They were certainly one in voice. They were certainly one in purpose. To make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then, in response to the singing, in response to the playing, singing and playing truth unto God, he is good, and his mercy does endure forever. That then, the Bible says, the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord. Verse 14, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. Let me give you this scenario in a modern church context. Man, we're singing. Singing unto the Lord. Praising God in voice and instrument. And God begins to move on our heart and move on our heart in such a way that the preacher says, I'm not going to mess this up. <laughs> I'm not going to mess this up by preaching. That's basically what he said. The ministers could not minister. It's different ministrations in the temple. I understand that. But that's basically the idea. The ministers could not even stand in the presence because it wasn't about men. It was about God. And that is the great error of our church. In the modern age, it has become about men as opposed to being about God. Right. Amen. So what needs to change, preacher? Nothing except for your heart. If it needs to, I'm giving implication. Your heart may not need to change. I know mine does. <laughs> because there's too many times that I'm thinking in my mind, let's get the singing over with so I can get to the preaching. Let's get the singing over with so I can get to the preaching. And that is not the way we should engage in worship. We come to worship the Lord God. Now our invitation is going to be a little bit different. Because I think the invitation should match the message. And so instead of coming forward this, this morning, and you can come forward during the singing if you want to, instead of coming forward for the invitation, we're going to sing the invitation. And Brother John's going to come 
and he's just going to lead us in two hymns this morning. And you just have to know my heart, okay? Just listen. I'm not asking you to do anything other than sing to the Lord. Okay? I'm not asking you to do anything other than sing to the Lord. Because it's not about pleasing me, it's not about pleasing, but it's about pleasing the Lord. But I am asking you to sing to the Lord. If music is the biblical approved method of worshiping God, should we not worship Him in the singing and playing of our music? And if you want to, guys, if you want to come play your instruments, please feel free to do that. While Brother John leads us, he's going to lead us in two songs. After that, he's going to pray. And then we'll have a baptism coming up. And so we're going to stand together and sing unto the Lord.